Mr. Benkin. Yeah, I'm trying to find you, Travis. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, man. There was just a, uh, uh, so you're sharing your screen, I see. Uh, yeah. So just need your video on and we can go from there. So okay. if you sure want to turn off your screen for a second while, while, while you're trying to get this thing rolling and then we can go once you're ready to rock. So while you're working on that, Eric, well, thank you so much for your time today, man. I mean, wow, this is uh, quite an honor. Uh, we've had some pretty amazing military leaders and you're going to be our capstone speaker for the day. So thank you so much for your time today, Eric. Oh, you're welcome, Travis. Let me... Uh... There we go. There we go. We got your video up and running. Um, so let me first take a couple minutes. You heard me say, uh, Eric, in, in I'm going to toot your horn a little bit. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting you recently when I got introduced to you uh, through David. And I, I just think it's, uh, I was, you know, of course, been, you know, cyber stalking you and everything else. Man, you did some amazing things in your time. So for everybody's knowledge, uh, Eric Benkin was the 12th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. So uh, joined the Navy for, out of Cincinnati, Ohio in 1970. So again, not to date you, but I was born in 73. So that should tell you something. This guy has all the yeah, knowledge in the world. Sure, go ahead. That's great. <laughs> so he served as the Air Force's Chief Master Sergeant from uh, 96 to 99. Some of your amazing accomplishments while serving in that position was you implemented the, uh, uh, so you uh, developed a Command Chief Master Sergeant title, just like a lot of others, so you're instrumental in that. You implemented the Warrior Week at basic training, which uh, it was pretty cool the creation of the CNO Professional Development Seminar. Uh, and then, which is a great segue, is that you were instrumental in developing the Air Force's core values of integrity, service before self, and excellence in all you do, which was released in a book called The Little Blue Book. So, Eric, I mean, your, your, your theme today is exactly that, core values. And it's very obvious that you have, you can absolutely be considered a resident expert in this, correct? Well, I think so. It was actually my boss, General Ron Fogelman, who, who issued the core values. And, you know, we were serving together as a team, of course. So, you know, my role in that was more of the execution and, and uh, helping figure out how we were going to put that out there and inculcate it into our uh, culture and, and things like that. So. Sure, absolutely. Other than that, so, you did pretty good for a, a sailor. That's, a, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I have my cheat sheet here, Eric. So, you know, again, I'm a sailor <laughs> through and through. So I had to learn how to speak a little bit of Air Force uh, for this. So, um, so, of course, I've got to kick things off with, uh, I don't know if you've watched any of this today uh, from the previous speakers, but I'd like to kick things off with kind of a unique question. Are you ready? Uh, yeah, like, uh, why do I live in Pensacola where we have the, uh, uh, second best aerial demonstration team or. Right. Well, like no, that. actually this is going to be a little more outside the box. So <laughs> here's the question. You're a new addition to the crayon box. What color would you be and why? Uh, I would be blue. Okay. Air force blue. I thought you were going to say Navy blue. <laughs> No, blue's always been my favorite cover, color, and uh, Air Force blue, you know, that's, so that would be my... I love it. I love it. So you bleed blue. I like the, like us. So that's something that the Air Force and Navy has in common. So everybody knows, and I'll just throw this out there, uh, because again, I want this to be authentic and real. Uh, for those who you are not in the military and watching this, uh, know that you're always going to hear a lot of banter between services. Uh, but the, the true fact is that when it all said and done, we're all fighting for our country. We're all serving. We've all raised our, our right hand to serve. And Eric, thank you for, so much for everything you've done for our country. Travis, thank you so much. All right, now look, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to step out. I know you're sharing your screen. Uh, so I'm sure you have a presentation uh, that you want to share with everybody. So uh, I'm going to get off here and the floor is yours. When I hear you coming to end, I'll come back on and we can open it up for some Q&A at the end. How's that? That's good. I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to kind of, you know, walk through this and, 
and uh, give my thoughts. Do you, want me to, uh, do you want me to turn off your screen then? Uh, however you want to do that. All right. I mean, you have, do you have anything to show on your computer? I do not. Just right, me. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. And then I am going to give you the screen, my friend. So okay. without further ado, the 12th Master Sar Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Eric Benkin. Thank you, man. All right. Thanks, Travis. All right. I'm coming from uh, sunny Pensacola. For a lot of you uh, Navy folks, I'm sure this is some place that you've probably been through and, and maybe it's some place that you want to come back to. So still a very thriving Navy town. And uh, my wife and I are happy to be a, a part of this uh, part of this location. So I'm an old guy like many of you. I uh, joined the Air Force probably on a whim. I was living in Houston, Texas uh, uh, back in 1970, back in the Stone Age and, and uh, I had graduated from high school. I had no money to go to college. wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up and, and uh, had uh, zero technical skills. So one day while I was stuck in a traffic jam with my mother in Houston, Texas, uh, I looked out the window and here's a recruiting poster that said, join the Air Force. So uh, I got out of the car, walked up, found a recruiter and said, hey, I want to get out of Houston, Texas. And he said, I can make that happen. And about three months later, I was on my way to Lackland Air Force Base to go through basic training. But the reason that I stayed uh, four years later after being assigned to Ellington Air Force Base, which by the way was Houston, Texas, they sent me 25 miles from my front door on my first assignment. I was in Taiwan and I spent several months in uh, the Republic of Vietnam and Saigon and then Bergstrom Air Force Base in Austin, Texas. So I had four assignments basically in a, in a very short four year period. But when I decided to stay, it was all about wearing the uniform and, and um, I'd always liked my Cub Scout uniform, my Little League uniform, and I really liked wearing the Air Force uniform. So that was a part of it. Uh, the missions that we did, uh, I enjoyed that, you know, defending our nation, that was our job. I thought that was important. Uh, and then really the people that I served with, I really enjoyed the, uh, the men and women that I served with during that period of time. And I also like being a, a part of a, a high performing team. So I was very fortunate, thanks to a lot of people, a lot of mentors along the way, uh, and a lot of folks that uh, I could lean on that I eventually became the, the Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force. During my tenure, I served with uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, Bob Hall, some of you may know him. I also served with uh, Mick Pond's John Hagen and, and Jim Hurt. And I served with uh, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Rick Trent, and Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, uh, Gary Lee. And uh, we testified together before Congress. And I can assure you that um, each one of those did their best for the men and women of their respective service. So anyway, you've had some outstanding uh, leadership presentations today and from some of uh, our most uh, respected military leaders past and present. And uh, as advertised, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about core values. So each of the services has uh, their core values. We're a values-oriented uh, organization, the military is. And um, the Navy and the Marines, for instance, have honor, courage, and commitment. Those are their uh, time-honored uh, core values. The Coast Guard has honor, respect, and devotion to duty. The Army decided to make it a little bit harder to remember, so they have uh, seven core values. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And they kind of tie those to the acronym leadership, L-D-R-S-H-I-P, which makes it a little bit easier for the recruits to remember. But our values um, that we have, regardless of service, they, they aren't just words for a promotion test or something like that. Uh, they have a direct impact on our ability to accomplish our mission. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our Air Force core values and a little bit of the history uh, behind uh, some of the things that went on with our core values and why we uh, tried very hard to incul inculcate those into our uh, culture. So if you're a military, military historian or if you're somebody who likes to read military history, uh, particularly Civil War history, 
you may have heard of a, uh, a general named William Tecumseh Sherman. He was uh, a general for the Union Army during the Civil War. And he had a quote that uh, I think uh, really applies to the military. He said, every army has a soul as well as a man. And I think that that's uh, true of, of any organization, whether it's a military unit, whether it's a football team, whether it's a police department, whether it's a civilian corporation or whatever it is, it has a soul and a spirit. When you think about an aircraft carrier or a destroyer, uh, each one of those is gonna function differently based on the uh, people that are associated with it. So the hearts, the minds, the souls of all those people in aggregate kind of make up the soul and the spirit of that ship if you kind of follow that reasoning. So the captain of that ship is responsible for the soul and the spirit of that particular ship. In the Air Force, it would be an Air Force wing and the associated squadrons, et cetera, et cetera. So great leaders like William Tecumseh Sherman who recognized that it wasn't just about the individual soldier, it was about the entire army that he was going to be commanding. They have a sixth sense. They develop a sixth sense, if you will, to, uh, to recognize whether that soul is in trouble or not, whether that spirit's in trouble. And some of the fixes that you can do as a leader, as a commander, um, are tangible kinds of things. For instance, if, you're, if your troops need resources, if they need ammunition, if they need housing or food or uh, if they need medical care, if their families need to be taken care of. Those are tangible things that, that you can uh, take care of. But there's also the intangible things that kind of go to uh, the values that we have. And if you have an erosion of discipline, if you have a loosening of the standards, if you have mediocre or if you have toxic uh, leadership, which would be the extreme, those are the kinds of intangible things that can kind of uh, weed themselves into a unit or into a, a, a squadron or into a ship or whatever. And those things have to uh, require the attention of a leader as well. But those things are a lot more difficult to discern than the tangible resources, if you will. So from 1994 to 1996, our Air Force had a, a series of unfortunate incidents that would uh, basically rattle the soul and the spirit of our Air Force. And these incidents have actually become case studies at some of our senior service schools and, and they serve as reminders uh, of what can easily go wrong uh, within one of our services if we become complacent or if we allow our values to slip. So I'm gonna give you a brief synopsis of these incidents. Um, if you want to, you can Google them. Uh, pretty easily and you can get the full uh, investigations and all of the things that uh, surrounded each one of these incidents and and uh, it makes them for for some pretty interesting reading if you will. So the first one took place on 14 April of 1994 and it was on the uh, border of uh, Turkey and Iraq and we had two Air Force 15s uh, F-15s that were patrolling the northern no-fly zone in Iraq and they were under the control of an Air Force AWACS aircraft which is kind of like a flying uh, command and control unit if you will. The pilots that were on uh, this particular patrol misidentified two U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopters and they thought that they were Soviet Hind helicopters and they wound up uh, shooting them both down. And this army mission was called Eagle Flight. It's something that had been operating in the no-fly zone for about a three-year period without incident. And the next thing you know, we had this incident of fratricide. So in addition to obliterating these two Black Hawk helicopters, uh, they wound up killing 26 military and civilians from five different countries. It was a uh, diplomatic team, if you will, that was on these two uh, helicopters. We also, Unfortunately for the Air Force, we also killed a young 26-year-old uh, Air Force Academy grad. So all of this made, uh, obviously, this inc incident very egregious, not only for our Air Force, uh, but uh, for our nation, uh, because it was in an overseas area. And there was a lot of media attention. There was a lot of media scrutiny. There was a lot of 
negativity, if you will, surrounding this, and rightfully so. And then there was a lot of uh, congressional oversight, as you can imagine, as this investigation and, and all of these things started to come out. So that happened on, in April of 1994. And, and uh, two months later, up at Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington, we had a B-52 aircraft uh, that crashed and killed all four crew members on board. And they were prepping for an air show that was going to take place the next day. So there were a lot of family members and, and uh, of course, a lot of the, the base uh, folks were there to watch this air show practice. So there were hundreds and hundreds of people on the flight line when this thing happened. And the crash was caused uh, basically because the aircraft was being flown beyond its operational limits. Uh, the pilot was kind of hot dogging and flying this aircraft like it was a fighter jet when it was a B-52 and it didn't have the altitude, didn't have the airspeed uh, to continue the mission and it wound up crashing on the runway. So what was especially egregious about this though, was when they did the investigation, they found out that the pilot had six major flight violations within a three year period, any one of which uh, should have taken him out of the cockpit. Uh, but the leadership failed and um, you had an accident that was totally avoidable that uh, never should have happened, it did happen, so. So we have those two incidents uh, that are kind of happening back to back. And uh, there were, you know, obvious a lot of issues associated with them. So where you know, the investigations are ongoing, it's taking a long time because there's, uh, is particularly in the first case with the shoot down, a lot of complexities that were associated with it. But in a brief two years later in April of 1996, uh, and I was the command chief for U.S. Air Forces in Europe at the time, I get a phone call that says that uh, we had a, an aircraft go down, and it turned out to be uh, our Air Force CT-43, which was basically like a Southwest 737-type uh, aircraft. Um, it was a, an asset that was stationed with us at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, and it had crashed into a mountainside in Dubrovnik, Croatia, while it was on approach to the airport in Dubrovnik. Um, Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown was, was on that aircraft. He was on a diplomatic mission for uh, President Bill Clinton. It was, this was gonna be a big CNN moment. There were gonna be a lot of uh, diplomats there to greet him. Uh, there were gonna be a lot of news broadcast, obviously associated with this or a lot of high profile people that were on the ground waiting on this aircraft to arrive. But obviously it didn't make it. And unfortunately there were existing directives that had prohibited uh, Air Force aircraft from going into this uh, airfield at all. So uh, never should have happened. Uh, a total of 35 people were killed. Um, in addition to the civilians and the diplomatic team that were associated with Secretary Brown, uh, were also uh, the two pilots and the four enlisted crew members, which uh, of course the boss and I had flown with. Uh, so this was one that uh, really affected me personally, if you will, and still, still does to this day. Uh, never should have happened. So, all of these incidents, uh, we do the investigations and we come up with some various findings and there's multiple things that had gone wrong. We had a failure to integrate Army and Air Force operations, which is kind of fundamental to how we do things in the joint environment, if you will. Um, there was an erosion of standards and discipline that was uh, fairly obvious. There was more modern equipment available that, that might have uh, made a difference in, in some of the aircraft had that equipment been uh, upgraded in a timely fashion. We found that we had training deficiencies that contributed to an ineffective job performance, if you will. Uh, there was a failure, obviously, to, to follow existing directives and, and guidance. Um, there was a failure by multiple leaders to take appropriate disciplinary action when it was required. And all of this, all of these things that had happened um, were kind of like a domino effect, if you will. And it was compounded at the time by the drawdown that we went through in the early 90s. So we were outsourcing 
a lot of jobs, a lot of functions, putting a lot of pressure on our people to do these deployments to Southwest Asia. So the operations tempo was extremely high. So there were a lot of uh, contributing factors that, uh, that went along with this. But we also found that there were um, things that were relative to our, our core values and, and kind of getting back the basics, if you will. There was breaches of integrity. There were obviously um, breaches of operational excellence in, in how we did or we didn't do our job right. And there were instances where individuals were more concerned with themselves than they were with their teammates, to, to be quite honest with you. So in marketing terms, uh, in, these two year, in this two year period, uh, you would say that uh, the Air Force brand was pretty much busted. Uh, the media was having a heyday with us. Uh, again, uh, countless uh, sessions of testimony uh, by the boss, by senior leaders at the Air Force in front of congressional leadership. And, and sometimes that can get uh, uh, pretty interesting, as, as you know, if you've ever done that before. Uh, so it's really a, a messy time for us. And we're really walking around with our heads down. And, you know, we had our shoulders kind of slumped and, and uh, we had lost a, a, lot of, a lot of our pride. So... After the uh, incident, the Dubrovnik incident, CT-43, uh, happened in April and November, I joined General Ron Fogelman as the 12th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. And the thing that I found about, uh, or that I liked about uh, General Fogelman was he had this sixth sense about him. He, uh, he was a military historian. He obviously knew... Uh, General Sherman and his background and his philosophy about the soul and the spirit of an army or the soul and the spirit of a unit. And he knew that the problems that we had in our Air Force were going much deeper than, you know, than absence of resources or training deficiencies or, or even the high ops tempo. And what he really realized was that we had, we had drifted uh, from our values and our guiding principles. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, the Air Force, we always had, um, you know, discipline standards and, and things like that. So it wasn't that we didn't have values. We just had not uh, really made them a, a part of the culture, if you will, and something that, you know, just kind of happened instinctively that you would use them as your guideposts, if you will. So he looks at all of this. Uh, there were a couple of other things that were going on or some contractor fraud that was happening. There were uh, a couple of high profile individual incidents and failures that had taken place. So he looks at all of this and he says, you know what, it's time to, to reboot the force. So the first thing he did, was he, he, had, he admonished the force with this, with this saying, and I think it's very important. The tools of our trade are lethal and we engage in operations that involve risk to human life and untold national treasures. And when you think about it, that's not just the Air Force, obviously, that's any, any branch of the military is gonna be involved in risking human life and untold national treasures. Our, the tools of our trade are lethal. And because of that, our standards must be higher than those of society at large. And we all know that, we know that we have to operate at a a much higher standard than you know our counterparts in the private sector. So part of what he did was he issued the little blue book that uh, Travis alluded to. It was kind of a pocket-sized book, if you will, that uh, every airman could carry uh, in their pocket. It was issued at uh, uh, all of our commissioning sources and things like that. But the three values that he settled on and prior to this in 1990, I think someone had, you know, we had seven or so, but uh, the three that he had settled on were integrity, which is your moral compass and doing what's right all the time. Uh, integrity is the foundation for trust uh, between brothers and sisters in arms. It's what unifies our force. It's our bond, if you will. And then service before self was the second. Um, it's a 24-hour reminder that we have a 24-hour-a-day commitment to our nation uh, and to what we do as a military. 
It's the willingness to make personal sacrifice, uh, if you will. And it's always about the unit good. It's never about your personal agenda. You know, it's about your teammates. It's about the unit. Excellence in all we do, we have to have a commitment to a higher standard, as we talked about before. Um, our operational excellence, it has to be a maximum team effort when we do something. Uh, you can't become complacent. It's, it's kind of like a, uh, a crew chief in an airplane. You know, if you have 10 steps on a checklist, you don't decide one day that you're going to skip steps four, five, and six because you want to go to lunch early or something like that. Um, obviously, complacency will damage your operational excellence, so you never do that. And then there's the matter of personal excellence, and that's making sure that uh, you keep yourself in good physical, mental uh, condition, and that, that you constantly refresh your, your technical expertise. So when he issued the little blue book, you know, he knew that um, that, that wasn't going to be enough. So he challenged our Air Education and Training Command to develop a strategy that was going to help inculcate our core values back into uh, our culture. So it was something that we kept top of mind 24-7, uh, and he challenged leaders to do this at, at all levels. So the commanders and senior non-commissioned officers were tasked to reinforce um, the core values at every level of command, whether it was uh, all the way down to squadron level. Um, we started to really put a focus at basic military training, the Air Force Academy, the ROTCs at the various colleges, uh, and OTS, all of our commissioning sources. There was a push on, on core values and discussing core values. Uh, we developed mentoring programs at the local level so that senior leaders could mentor uh, our younger folks and talk about core values. Uh, commanders were encouraged to raise a conscious level of, of the core values to uh, constantly reiter reiterate them with our, our folks. And then when we started, to, we looked at our curriculum uh, at all of our professional military education. And we started to weave the values into all of the, the things that we were instructing, um, leadership in particular, that we were instructing in our professional military education, we started to weave in the core values. You know, So if you had a scenario where you, you said, okay, if in this particular case, somebody didn't have integrity, what might happen? You know, What are the bad things that might happen? So you start to talk about that. What if somebody, you know, didn't do their job as they should, and they didn't rise to the level of operational excellence that we expect in the Air Force or in the military, then, you know, what are the consequences of something like that happening? So ultimately, the success of the, the Air Force uh, was going to be that we incorporate those values into the character of every airman, uh, especially when they first came in and, and, and you started pounding that that message uh, into their hearts and their minds and their souls, uh, if you will. So uh, I think we were, you know, very um, successful in, in doing that initially and getting that out. And, and uh, but it's something that you have to keep your foot on the gas. You know, you can't, uh, you can't throttle back uh, on the values and, and reinforcing integrity and service and excellence and whatever your values are. And I'd like to say that the issuance of the Little Blue Book and all of those things that we did back in 1997 um, would mean that uh, after that period of time, we would never have another incident. We would never have an accident that would be caused by uh, a breach of our core values or anything like that. But obviously that hasn't been the case over the years. We've had some more incidents. And then it, uh, it always breaks my heart, you know, when I uh, look at a headline in the Air Force Times and we see a senior leader who has done something where the uh, commander in chief or somebody has lost confidence in their ability to lead. That's kind of the term we use today, you know, losing confidence. So um, unfortunately, you know, we've had it, we continue to have incidents like that, personal failures, and we also have 
unfortunately, some uh, incidents with uh, aircraft and things like that. But uh, I would like to say that those are anomalies and, you know, more so than what we were experiencing from 1994 to 1996, where it seemed like, you know, we just kept having one, you know, right after the other. So today I think they're anomalies. And I think the people that um, get into trouble and get involved in scandals, I think that's an anomaly too. I think the, the vast, vast, vast majority of the people that are leading in our military forces are doing the right thing, um, that they uh, have their values in their hearts and minds as they go about doing the job. So let me kind of finish this out a little bit uh, with some leadership reminders. And uh, I think that first of all, our values define our conduct and our character, how we treat each other as brothers and sisters in arms. And, you know, that we constantly do the right thing all the time, even when nobody's watching. A reminder from General Fogelman that we have to operate at that higher standard, that the tools of our trade are lethal. We're not Walmart, we're not Kmart, we're not Ford Motor Company. The things that we do can get somebody seriously hurt or can get somebody killed. We have to hold ourselves accountable and others accountable. And when we see somebody doing something wrong, we have to make the tough call. We have to confront negative behavior and, and uh, make sure that we you know, stop people that are doing the wrong thing. We definitely want to avoid past mistakes. You know, some of these things, unforgivable consequences. You know, I had to go to the funerals of all of those uh, airmen that were involved in the CT-43 ac accident in Brodnik, Croatia. And, uh, you know, that broke my heart and it breaks my heart to this day to, uh, to know that uh, that happened to them and it didn't have to. And then leaders are entrusted with the soul of the, of the service. So whether it's the Air Force, whether it's the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, Army, uh, leaders are entrusted with the soul and the spirit. And if you wanna be a great leader, develop that sixth sense and realize that there is that intangible piece of leadership out there, you know, that goes far deeper than, you know, giving your troops the resources to do the job and the tangible things to do their job. Um, I think the intangible things that, that you have to, to watch for the morale issues and, you know, each individual that's under your supervision, you know, to recognize, you know, are they having an issue to be able to discern whether, you know, hey, is it a financial issue? Is it a marriage issue? Is it a relationship issue? Or whatever it might be that's causing them angst. A, a really great leader is able to kind of look at that and, and, and figure that out, if you will. So. Uh, every leader has to keep their values, uh, take them seriously, keep them in your heart and your mind, under, recognize the soul and spirit is what's really important. And the last thing I would say is stay focused on your mission, take care of your teammates, always lead with integrity, and especially in this environment today, make sure you stay safe. And there's my shipmate, David Deary. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Hey, good, Eric. How are you? Th thanks for joining good. us today, man. And thank thanks for, you know, just, you know, opening your heart and, and, uh, you know, just telling us some, some stuff and, you know, showing us inside a little bit. It's not very often that, uh, when you get to, you know, when you get to a level, level of leadership that many of us have achieved to get someone to be that transparent and open. Um, but man, it's so refreshing when we do, because, People need to hear it. You know, we hurt just like the young ones. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes when, when you get to that level, who, who you can turn to? You got to be able to get out of your system. So uh, we could all learn from it. Uh, th thanks, for, thanks for sharing those words. Let me add one more thing. You know, uh, David, you and I work for a civilian company. And just for those of you that may not be in the military, uh, Dave and I work, uh, well, he still does. He works for USAA. But when I got there 20 years ago, the first thing that they told us when we got, uh, we were going through the employee orientation was they said, hey, we have values in this company, honesty, integrity, loyalty, and service. And if you don't buy into those values, you're not going to stay here at USAA. So it's not just the military where values are important. You look at a company like Enron, for those that can remember that debacle, you know, or you look at... Uh, 
some of the companies that you see in the news where they do things wrong and they have breaches of integrity, they've lost sight of their values. And so it's any organization that's, you know, it's, if you're values driven, you're going to be successful. If you're not values driven, you're bound to fail. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, a couple hours ago, uh, Mike Stevens, uh, our former McPon, uh, Travis asked him an opening question kind of, uh, and, and really the, the gist of Mike's answer was it came down to core values, you know, both personal core values and corporate core values that led to a, a decision that created a sweeping change across our Navy. Um, you know, I, I recently, uh, I, I listened to a lot of John Maxwell podcast videos and, and uh, things like that as a, as a John Maxwell team person. And, you know, he even, as he'll say, you know, uh, leadership rises and falls uh, with the people. And he said, you know, he said recently, you, could, you make your decisions with people in mind, people focused. That doesn't mean the decision is going to be perfect, right, or work its way out. But, you know, you're going to be able to sleep well at night. Uh, right. You really can't go wrong when you make your decisions putting people first. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Agree yeah. So, so uh, Eric, uh, so I'm trying to see. So first of all, let me just throw it out there. If you, anybody has any questions, uh, I'm monitoring Facebook and the Q&A here. Please don't hesitate to ask some questions. I think we have a little bit more uh, time of Eric's time. Uh, but while we wait for that, uh, first off, just Eric, just so you know, we've literally I've been having people uh, chime up. We have people from all over the world uh, watching this today, so it's pretty cool. From Okinawa to Florida to uh, all over, it's pretty fun to watch. Um, so I have a couple of questions I want to kind of kick in with you, and I think that it goes along with core values and everything we talked about is when you preach core values and you're trying to do the right thing all the time, some people are going to give you public criticism for the job that you're doing in any role. So how do you handle criticism when you're faced with it in any leadership role that you've had in your career? Well, I think there's, you know, I, you mentioned the command chief stripe, for instance. Okay. So that was, uh, that involved changing our history and, and our, tradition, if you will, in the Air Force, we had a role, uh, a title that was called Senior Enlisted Advisor. Mm -hmm. And I had always felt that that title was too uh, ambiguous, too vague, uh, or whatever. And, you know, as I went around the Air Force, I would have a young, you know, O3 introduce an E6 as his Senior Enlisted Advisor. And I said, well, no, that's not exactly the intent. You know, we have 3,000 at the time that are designated senior list advisor. And we didn't have a, uh, a unique stripe or anything. So if I walked into a room of 30 uh, E9s chiefs, uh, I didn't know who represented the commander. I didn't know who represented, you know, that person. So uh, I had always said early on in my career, if I ever had the opportunity to change that, I would, I would do that, you know. So next thing you know, I wind up in the Pentagon and but um, when we were making that decision, I sat down with the major command folks and I said, okay, here's kind of the direction I think we ought to go. And, and then we came to a, a consensus. And I knew that when I did that, I was gonna take criticism. I knew that there were gonna be chiefs that, that said, hey, you know, even some of my peers, quite honestly, you know, there's only been 18 chief mass sergeants at Air Force. At that time, there was only 12. So there were several of the older folks, if you will, that uh, they didn't like it and they didn't like the title. So I knew I was going to get criticism for it and, and things like that. But I think you just, you know, that comes with the territory. I think that, um, you know, looking back on it, I think most people, certainly those that are serving in those positions today, think that that was the right decision uh, that we made and we did that. Uh, but uh, yeah, you take criticism and, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I was in the Air Force Times, I think 46 times or something like that. And, you know, you, you listen to those people and so what? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've heard many times and is, this is kind of thing rings true. It's a question I ask because it's, it's something that it's a, it's a question that uh, resonates whatever, wherever you're at, whether you're in the military or in the civilian sector. And the, the biggest thing I hear is you just got to, and you heard Dave talking, uh, Dave Braun talking about it too. You just got to kind of 
like block out the negativity because the the few pieces of criticism you get can overwhelm you, right? Like mm -hmm. you can have a thousand bad boys, but one person criticize you and that's all you can focus on and it brings you down. And I just think that that's what, that, like exactly how you said it. I think that's how most people should look at any kind of criticism is just cut out that, cut out the negativity in your life. Yeah. You're not, I mean, on any given day, you're not going to get a hundred percent agreement on something, you know, and, and, you know, it's kind of like president of the United States, you know, I mean, look at, the constant criticism, you know, that he gets and, and all that, but you got to decide what you think is best and you got to press on and you just got to realize that you're going to have that chatter out there and uh, you just got to kind of rise above it. If you take that home and, and let that bother you, or if you're worried about what's going to be said about you in the next edition of the Navy times or, or something like that, you know, you drive yourself crazy. So, yeah. and, and, you know, sometimes that criticism is necessary, right? Uh, yeah. When done constructively, when, when, when done in a professional manner, um, I mean, Travis, I'll tell you what, ever since he came on the board, one thing I really appreciate about Travis, and I knew this about him uh, when we made, him, made the invitation, because I've worked with him, I've known him for a number of years, but, uh, you know, Travis is great at saying, yeah, but what if, um, or why are we and not, uh, but at the end of the day, you, you listen, you explain, and the decision's made and then we move on. But sometimes, uh, sometimes, um, oftentimes, many times, um, Travis and others like him, it gets me, because, you know, there's, there's so many different ways to get the end result, you know? So if you start with the end in mind, so long as you get to the end and you're doing it legally, ethically, morally, really doesn't matter which path you take. Right. I mean, how else are we gonna build up leaders? If we don't people give people an opportunity to spread their wings, uh, you know, it's, a, it's like I, I read or heard recently, you know, jump and grow your wings on the way down. You know, let people just jump, let them, let them go for it. Because, you know, give them parameters for success, tell them where they need to operate. But the end, if the end state is gonna be the same, good, you know, who ya? Well, uh, listen, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I was going to shout out to one of our other board members, Rosa Wilson. You just mentioned her, one of her famous sayings that guided me through all the decisions that I make is, uh, she always told me when I first met her as my CMC, she says, uh, you know, just trust your decision. As long as you can answer those three questions, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, and then just follow your gut. And those are really the only smell test you have to do. So I, I love that. So what do you say, Aaron? Yeah. yeah, when you go back to, you know, as you're talking about constructive criticism, you know, the, the, the folks that were my closest advisors, which is, I guess, your force, Master Chiefs, right? So you had that circle of major command um, advisors that kind of sit down with you and, you know, you go through things. And they represent basically the entire Air Force, you know, like Air Mobility Command, Air Combat Command, uh, Special Operations Command, all that. So each one of those senior leaders sits down with you. And I can tell you the, the best ones were the ones that would fight with me. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that would say, hey, chief, I disagree with you. I, I think we ought to go this way. You know, the, the ones that would just sit there and just say, you know, shake their head yes, they're, they're of no value to you. You've got to, and then as a leader, you've also got to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna open up. I'm gonna let them, let them raise their voice, let them get it out of their system. You, you have to be able to do that, you know, so. As long as you Absolutely. treat each other with respect, you got to fight like brothers and sisters, right? You still love each other, but you got to fight like brothers and sisters and you never get anything done. Absolutely. Well, look, we have an actual question. We have a question that uh, hit us online. Uh, it's actually uh, Stephen Chartier, as an old shipmate of mine off to San Diego. He says, when faced with uh, some type of adversity, whether it be personal or professional, which, triggers an emo which does tr trigger an emotional response what are some of the thoughts or ideas that you utilize to quote unquote filter or manage your response? Um, when I was a young chief and I had first had my chief stripes on my E9 stripes, if you will, um, I was serving in a NATO assignment and I, I think I was the uh, kind of brash, if you will, or, you know, I was quick to kind of, throw the emotion in there, you know, throw the emotion oh, yeah. in there. I've never lived like that in my life. <laughs> anyway, just become emotional about something. 
And the more emotional you get, I think the more irrational you sound to the person you're trying to get your point across, right? There was this uh, German lieutenant colonel that I worked with, and he, he was the exec officer to the two-star that we, we both served at the time. And uh, so one time in the open area there, me and this Air Force colonel and anyway, a couple other people, we got into an emotional discussion. And uh, I guess I was probably more emotional than anybody else. Anyway, this German lieutenant colonel says to me, he says, Eric, he says, you give yourself 24 hours, 24 hours. And I said, what do you mean? He says, when you get into this situation, he said, you, you step back. You step back and you give yourself 24 hours to think about it. And then you come in with the, with your, and make your case. And you do it without the emotion. And he was basically telling me to check my emotions and stuff like that. So I think, I think that was some really good advice. And I tried to follow that most of the time after that. So didn't know. Well, it's always the journey, right? It's, you know, we're never po fully polished when we come out the door. The whole journey is what gets us where we are today. What's the old saying? You only wish you knew then what you know now? Yeah. God, that's not a true statement. But I also found that, that uh, if I could write it down and make my case in writing, oh. you always want to give your boss all the varying points of view. You always want to give them the entire story so that they can make a decision. And I always found that um, you know I could write it down and I could make my case in writing. And then if you do it that way, you don't have to get emotional. you know. It's all there, it's all fact-based, and it takes the emotion out of it. Because I found, you know, early on, that if you go in emotional, you, typically you're gonna lose the argument, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So, David, what do you got for Eric? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna, Travis, you ask the questions. I just, you know, I'm just learning here, taking it all in. You know, I, I, I would only, um, the only thing I, I found you know, to complement Eric's answers, you know, there's there's a fine line between emotion and passion. Mm -hmm. and, and I have found myself justifying my emotion, uh, my my frustration by saying I'm passionate about fill in the blank. Right. And, sure. and, and you know, and I, you know, I too, I just I had found over the years if I just write it down. You know, they say, you know, don't send the email when you're angry, but it's okay to write it. Don't um, get angry. <laughs> yeah, you know, write it out. Get it out there and hit save or delete. Get it out of my system. And, and whoever asked the question, you know, the higher up you go in a leadership ladder, uh, it's like as a parent, you know, you, you, if you ever wonder how you're doing, how you, they look at how your kids act because they're learning it somewhere. And, you know, the higher up you go, you're, you're being watched all the time. Right. Uh, and that, that really is a humbling thing on how you respond emotionally to a question or a situation. Right. Um, people are going to see it. They're going to pay attention. And you can lose some credibility if you're not careful. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I go back far enough. You know, when you go back to 1970 or the 60s or whatever, you know, a lot of the leadership style at that time, particularly at the flag officer level, was quite honestly, they were considered alligators. I mean, you know, it was a downward directed, you know, sometimes brutal. I, you know, I watched that happen in conferences where you would have a wing commander or a flag officer just absolutely brutalized verbally, a, you know, young officer or something like that. And so I, I, you know, I grew up in that era, you know, of people doing that. And then Obviously, over the years, as you know, our services have evolved, and you know, in our our enlisted force has become much more professional. You know, then that kind of those kinds of attitudes and those kinds of you know the way they acted, you know, obviously changed. And uh, the enlisted force and the officer close officer force, which work much more closely together uh, today than they ever did. You know, but there was a time when there was a, that delineation was very strict. I mean, here's the officers, here's the enlisted, and neither the two shall meet, you know. So. I got another good question here, Eric, uh, from Kyle. 
Uh, he says, any good recommendations on effectively implementing devil's advocate discussions in a meeting without letting the group run rampant? Um. That could be a challenging, uh, that's, that's a tough one sometimes, right? So, well, let me try to digest that a little bit. So we're, we're in a, I'll read that, it again. So and you want to be, and you want to be the devil's advocate, right? right. You so want, any recommendation on effectively implementing quote unquote devil's advocate discussions in a meeting without letting the group run rampant, because we all know that, right? You know, whenever you're trying to be devil's advocate, it stirs up the pot. If you don't do it the right way, I think that's the question that's being asked. Yeah. Um, Gosh, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, every one of those meetings or sessions that you're going to have is going to be a little bit different. Uh, you know, the dynamics are going to be a little bit different. But, you know, I would say if you want to be the devil's advocate or if you want to present the opposite side or if you want to, um, you know, promote uh, a differing view on something, you know, first of all, you have to do it respectfully and you have to know who your audience is, you know, where you're doing it. But, uh, the main thing I would say is don't don't hold back. I mean, don't don't let the idea that you're gonna be the devil's advocate or that you're gonna present a different position or something like that. Don't let that stop you from doing that. You know what I mean? I mean, I I, I think we've all been in situations where, you know, we walked away from there and said, "Man, I wish I'd have said this. I wish I'd have said that." Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't want to have those kind of regrets. You want to you know walk away saying, "Hey." And then if you have people that, that don't accept your point of view, you know, then I, I guess you're in different territory there. But, uh, you know, hopefully there's not too many sessions like that. Right. Well, awesome. Well, gosh, Eric, I, I mean, out of respect for your time, I, man, I can't thank you enough. It was so insightful. Uh, and let me first also just, because it's something I'm pretty, quote unquote, passionate about uh, in our careers, you know, we've been thanked for our service uh, our entire career. You, however, served in a time where you served thanklessly. And you not only served during the Vietnam War when it was truly thankless either, but you continue to serve despite the, the uh, polarizing environment that you had during that time. So let me just be public to say, just thank you for your service because your generation in, our, in serving is a whole new level of of devotion and dedication to service. So I just want to say thank you for that, everything you've done for our country as well. Thanks, Travis. I really appreciate that. I really do. Awesome. Well, I don't think we have, I mean, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of people commenting saying that everything was fantastic today. Uh, I mean, great comments, people coming through just saying thank you, Eric, for your time. And uh, man, I just, we, I didn't know what, how this was going to come together. Uh, I'm just very uh, honored and blessed that people have stepped up and, and donated their time uh, to make this happen. So thank you for that. Well, thanks for reaching out. I appreciate it. And, you know, hopefully some of this Air Force, uh, you know, stuff uh, worked for you. We'll see. Hey, well, we what we'll do is we're going to bring here, this up. We'll have it uh, set up in different sessions. So any of your contacts in the Air Force, you'll be able to send it out to them so they can uh, share it amongst themselves and watch it at their leisure. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Eric. All right. Thanks, All right. Thanks All guys. Right, so, thanks, Eric.